Megan Abbott to join us, please. ಮತ್ತೊಮ್ಮೆ ಜೋರಾದ ಚಪ್ಪಾಳೆ ಬಲ್ಲಿ ಮೇಘ್ನಾ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಶಿ ಡೆಫಿನೆಟ್ಲಿ ಮೆಸ್ಮರೈಸ್ ಟು ವಿತ್ ಹರ್ ಲವ್ಲಿ ವಾಯ್ಸ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ನಾವ್ ಎಸ್ ವಿ ಇಮರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮೆಲಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸಾಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದ ನೇಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಗ್ನಿ ದೇವತಾ ಲೇಡೀಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಜೊಲ್ಮಿನ್ ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಲ್ಕೇಮ್ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮ್ ಜೆ ಸಾಯ್ ದೀಪಕ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಶ್ರೀಮಾನ್ ಟಿ ವಿ ಮೋಹನ್ ದಾಸ್ ಪೈ ಟು ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ಇಸ್ ಆನ್ ಸ್ಟೇಜ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಲೈಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಲ್ಯಾಂಪ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್
ಅಗ್ನೇನಯ ಸುಪಥಾರಾಯ ಅಸ್ಮಾನ್ ವಿಶ್ವಾಸ್ಮಜ್ಜುಹುರಾಣಮೇಣ ಭೂಯಿಷ್ಠಾಂತೆ ನಮ ಉಕ್ತಿ ವಿಧೇಮ ವೈಶ್ವಾನರಾಯ ವಿಮಹೆ ಲಾಲೀಲಾಯ ಧೀಮಹೆ ತನ್ನೋ ಅಗ್ನಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯಾತ್ ಉದ್ದೀಪ್ಯ ಸ್ವಜಾತವೇದೋಪಘ್ನಿರತಿ ಮಮ ಪಶುಗುಶ್ಚ ಮಹ್ಯಮಾವಹ ಜೀವನಂಚ ದಿಶೋ ದಿಶಾ ಮನೋ ಹಿ ಗುಂಸಿ ಜಾತವೇದೋ ಗಾಮ ಜಗತ್ ಅಭಿಭ್ರದಗ್ನ ಆಗಹಿ ಶ್ರಿಯ ಮಾ ಪರಿಪಾತಯ And now, ladies and gentlemen, I request Dr. Swaroop Rangnath, the co-founder of Samskritam Academy for Teachers Training and Value Addition to address the audience for all of us, please. So please help me in welcoming, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Swaroop Rangnath for all of you. Namasadase, namasadasaspataye, namasakhi naam puroga naan chakshushe, ನಮೋ ದಿವೇ ನಮ ಪೃಥಿವ್ಯೈ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಒನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಟುಡೆ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಮೇಜರ್ ಅಕೇಶನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಒನ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಆನಿವರ್ಸರಿ ಆಫ್ ಡೇ ವಿ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಫಾರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಹಿ ಹಸ್ ಡನ್ ಹಿ ಚೇಂಜ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವ್ಯೂ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ದ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ರೀಸನ್ ವೈ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೈ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅಕೇಶನ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಲಾಂಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಾಯಿ ದೀಪಕ್ ಜೈ ಸಾಯಿ ದೀಪಕ್ ಸರ್ ಬುಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ on this occasion uh, we need to uh, set a few things uh, a doubt set uh, i'm very happy uh, and very glad uh, to have accepted this invitation uh, from uh, jay sai deepak sir to run this entire show we very glad to do that um, more than that uh, we have a few things to share with all of you the first thing is this uh, sanskritam academy for teachers training and value addition the acronym is satva for the last 5 uh, years has been trying to uh, bring in the indic content uh, to the audience in the way the, the contemporary world understands uh, we have come up till date uh, six ma- with with six major projects and the first uh, first project which we came up was this uh, to bring back the vedas to the masses so generally the moment we think of the vedas the mantras what comes to our mind is uh, uh the 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 priests performing certain rituals so beyond that uh, the mantras had almost very little reach except for uh, the gurukula students learning it and again uh, using it mainly for the uh, priestly purposes there are a few institutes and academies across the globe where there is a serious research happening in the uh, vedic uh, 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 veda as a topic however uh, what we did uh, in the last 5 uh, years is to develop a topic called Uh, an idea and concept called vedanada uh, this was our first concept wherein we uh, we we uh, took the help of the nada the the music and when we integrated uh, veda with the nada it became a, it became a concept the vedic concept the first first world uh, world's first vedic concept uh, and through this program through this program uh, we uh, brought out the essence of the vedas and we also narrated the meaning of the same and when we started doing this uh, you know we 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 could uh, probably not only just bring back the the essence of the vedas we did something more uh, what we tried to do was this uh, understand that the vedas is something which we use in a daily basis yet we don't know that we are using it and this was our effort uh, to bring in those ideas which were already using it and make it uh, uh, much more experiential make it much more uh, easier to understand and apart from uh, this particular uh, concept we came up with uh, three major concepts and one is going to get launched very soon the concept is this 
generally, uh, the moment we think of uh, Bhagavad Gita, what happens to us is this. We think of it as a, a religious book or we look at it as a philosophical treatise. Uh, apart from these two things, you know, we sometimes forget that it is an anubhava, it is an experience. So what we have done uh, very importantly is this. We have written uh, 18 short stories and each short story summarizes the essence of one particular chapter. And this way, uh, we're coming up with short movies and uh, October 9th is our first uh, short movie which is being released. Uh, that it, it summarizes the third chapter, the Karma Yoga. And apart from that, we have three things, which is, our, which is our core, what we believe is our core idea. One, if a language has to enter uh, the mainstream, probably people have to listen to it. And uh, just listening to it sometimes doesn't really help. And if you probably add music to it, it makes a lot of sense. And that's when we thought we should come up with a lot of Sanskrita songs. And uh, we have been working hard uh, to make sure Sanskrita song uh, goes beyond the traditional belief that you know anything Sanskrita is just attached to Bharatanatya, anything Sanskrita is just attached to some stotras, or anything Sanskrita is just attached to uh, certain aspects of uh, shlokas or maybe some traditional music. So we are trying to represent the idea of Sanskrita with the contemporary uh, music attached to it. And today we have uh, one of the songs being launched on the. Uh, uh, on the day where we remember Vivekananda, uh, we will, you'll get to know more about it. And we have been consistently working with uh, certain unique ideas by being in touch with Himalayan masters. As you all see on to the right of the uh, auditorium, a very unique uh, picture there. And this was created by uh, a great artist Jagdish Kadur. Uh, he's in Bangalore. So uh, I was in uh, Kurukshetra when I got an opportunity to meet a great yogi. So we were moving around in Kurukshetra and a yogi asked me, have you ever seen Bhima? It was a big question. I, I told no, of course not. And he told, you might have not met Bhima. I have met him. I have lived with him. I've, I'm, 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 he told, he has lived through for the last 5,000 years. That's what he told me. And he told, this is exactly how Bhima used to be. He was a human cradle. He was a human cradle. And he further explained it beautifully as to how Bhima used to lock his uh, feet and hands uh, to a banyan tree and used to uh, uh, keep, you know, children on his stomach and swing and uh, create that uh, sense of joy to children. Yeah. When he explained this and he further told, I would assign you a small task, if possible, recreate this as an image. Let people understand uh, how the idea of uh, Mahabharata was not just philosophical, how playfully people lived, how spontaneously people lived. So this is one image which is right in front of you. Uh, narrated to us by a yogi and uh, when yogi told us he has lived through 5,000 years uh, that was a very uh, vast idea which I couldn't grasp of course uh, what he has told is something phenomenal and uh, I took an opportunity to, to go through the major aspects of Mahabharata's virginal shlokas and I couldn't find a reference to this I couldn't find a reference to this uh, so this is something phenomenal uh, when I listen from a yogi's uh, mouth as to how uh, Bhima was and this is one of those things. And uh, we have uh, again try, you know, try to be in touch with a lot of Himalayan masters and trying to access certain uh, vidyas which is there within us. Unfortunately today Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Sutras, Yoga Sutras, even Kama Sutras for that matter, uh, there is a lot of tremendous potential in it. We have not touched them, we have not seen their actual potential. And uh, what we did was this, we realized many, many Upanishadic, Upanishadic meditations uh, because there is no guru to teach you to the and take you to the next level, they have uh, remained in the books. They've got uh, just stuck to the books. And we got an opportunity to uh, go through a beautiful Upanishad called Shandilya Upanishad, again initiated by a, a teacher. And uh, we want to show something about that as well today. So we take a little time. I know all of you are excited to uh, listen to Sai Deepak sir, but then we have three small presentations. And this is to... Uh, basically uh, you know show that there is a lot of scope as as such when it comes to the indie content because indie content just can't remain intellectual just can't remain to the elite and we have been trying to make sure that the masses understand that there is much more which they can take back home enjoy relish cherish and it is in this direction uh, sattva has been working with the masses and um, uh, we will move on to the next uh, part of the event. We have three small uh, unique ideas. I hope you all enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr.
group for completing the moment for all of us. Dhanyavadagalu. Now moving on, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to welcome on stage Dr. Arvind Bhatt, who is going to brief us on Satwa's vision. Add Samskritam songs to your playlist, followed by which we get lost in a cinematic experience. All of you will receive the link of this video to your WhatsApp. Once it is launched on the YouTube, we request all of you to kindly like, subscribe and share it. And I'm sure all of you will add this Sanskrit song and the other Sanskrit songs which will be played after the event to your playlist. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Arvind Bhatt to join us on stage, please. Sarvebhyaha Shubhasayam Namamsi. So, in the age of media supremacy, content is the king. Visually rich content backed up by quality audio can perform magic. Conveying ideas that can both entertain and make the audience think positively is the need of the hour. Noble ideas and concepts which can bring about an awareness of our country's culture and heritage is one area which we Indians have to establish at the world's stage. Sattva Samskritam Academy for Teachers Training and Value Addition has been actively conceiving hundreds of ideas that can bring about a change in the way the world looks at India. Today, we release one such product that shows the importance of concentration or focus, dharana or concentration as we call it, under the Ashtanga Yoga in our Indic space. To convey such profound ideas in lightest possible manner is our effort. In this direction, come, let's watch a Samskrita song that conveys dharana in the way the contemporary world understands it. Chitra Chitra Vichitru Hama Swapna Sia Gatrantu Bhayana Kama Chitra Suchitra Chitra Suchitru Chitra, 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 Chitra,
Thank you so much. And now moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to welcome on stage Dr. Savita, who will explain us about the concept Vaishnavi Mudra, followed by which we watch a trailer of the same. And all of you will receive the link of this video. A make worked meticulously once it and is, with integral. Once it is launched on the YouTube, so we request all of you guys to kindly like, share and subscribe. So let's welcome Dr. Savita to join us on stage, please. Namaste. Uh, I am Dr. Savita, an ophthalmologist by profession, uh, but a huge fan of Bharatiya Parampara by passion. Deho Devalaya Proktaha, which means our body is a temple. Thus, it is sanctified. We address the consciousness within us as Shakti, Prakriti, Shiva, and so on. Irrespective of the names, what matters is the divinity attached to it. If all of us at all times were to actively participate in the overall functioning of the human body, probably our life would be unimaginably and inexplicably crazy. Well, as we all aware, that's not the case. Our body performs optimally and the mind is eager to support us in all its capacity. However, the question is not whether we are using our body to its full extent. The question is, are we thanking our body enough for all that it is doing to us despite being less maintained and sometimes ill-maintained also? Brain, because of its plasticity, can be trained till the last breath of our life. Gratitude is a thoughtful appreciation for what an individual receives whether tangible or intangible. Gratitude practice towards our own body stimulates the bliss center in the brain, which in turn releases good hormones that have positive effects on the body, like mood regulation, regularizes sleep patterns, reduces stress, blood pressure, pain, boosts immunity, etc. And these have long-lasting effects on the body resulting in overall well-being of the individual. Lots of research are going on in the Western world as always about the effect of gratitude expression towards our own body on the brain and the mental health. However, we have this novel yogic technique, Vaishnavi Mudra, found in Shandilya Upanishad from time immemorial. It's a meditative practice wherein each and every part of the body is revered and thanked in a wakeful state. We at Sattva are committed to reinvent, research and reinforce such novel techniques deep rooted in Bharatiya Parampara. Come, let's unveil Vaishnavi Mudra's trailer now. Dhanyavada. A maid worked meticulously and with integrity for many houses. A maid worked meticulously and with integrity for many houses. Her children noticed the mother's happiness, especially when she returned from a particular family. One day, her children asked the reason for her cheerful mood, for which she said, in this house, they treat me as part of their family. 
I get to eat hot and fresh food which they prepare for themselves. While in other houses, either I get stale food or the leftover food. Did we notice in this house, everyone gratefully treated her as their own. It was much beyond the salary they paid her respectfully. Isn't gratitude a frequently used word and under-practiced quality? Bharatiya civilization understands universe as a synonym of life. Hence, during various Hindu festivals, people acknowledge the life within the flora and fauna, therefore gratefully worship and celebrate the same on par with every other gods and goddesses. The frenzy around the festivals reaches its tipping point when people recognize and honor with gratitude the home appliances, the utensils, toolkit at the garage and the vehicles they use. What if this attitude of gratitude is extended to one's own body, mind and soul? Appreciating and preserving the unique human body should be our fundamental duty. It is a way to show our gratitude to the Creator. Just like we returned a book borrowed from a library in the state we received it. We are expected to return this body to nature in the most pristine form. The bliss center in the brain is stimulated when we show gratitude to the human body and thus release hormones which in turn makes us physically renewed and mentally rejuvenated. To live life to the fullest extent, human beings have a powerful privilege to practice the multi-dimensional yoga. The signs of experiences developed by the sages of ancient Bharatiya civilization. Vaishnavi Mudra is one such yogic technique found in Shandalyobanishad, which helps us converse with the body and offer it our gratitude. As we keep our eyes wide open and stay awake and alert in a supine position, we thank each part of the magnificent human body meaningfully. Each part of the body is indispensable to our existence. Without much of our intervention, each part functions harmoniously with the rest of the body. In this practice, we get a comprehensive understanding of the body parts, its function and its interrelation with the other parts. This technique is a splendid inward journey which makes us realize the secrets of the human body and the existence at large. I was, also, check, check, check. I was also waiting for you guys if it's over or not or you know to come or not on stage. So yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And now moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to invite on stage Karthik Manjanath, who will tell us about the importance of Nitya Puja, followed by which we shall all witness the trailer of the same. All of you will receive the link of this video to your WhatsApp. Once it is launched on the YouTube, we request all of you to like it and share it. So please help me in welcoming Mr. Karthik Manchanath to join us on stage, please. Namaste everyone. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Pyaje Dagnana Nirmalyam Soham Bhavena Pujayet. This is the essence of puja. I'm pure. I'll become pure, I'll be clean, and I'll become one with the universe. If there is anything which is fundamental to the Bharatiya civilization, it is only the purification of mind. All the Upanishads, the Gita, the Yoga Sutra, the Brahma Sutra, including the Kama Sutra, cherish the idea of purification. That is one of the primary reasons why we begin our day with the puja so that the day starts with a pure mind. The more and more we are inspired by the nature and the more and more we are in sync with the nature, we understand the true human existence. Every Guru and Acharya has spoken about Chitta Shuddhi, 
which is the purification of thoughts. This alone leads to the purification of actions, which means it doesn't matter what we are trying to construct, but the intentions with which the construction happens, it can be anything. Nitya Puja or Puja Vidhana is one such methodology which will help us in this endeavor. We from Sattva have made an attempt to bring in various concepts of Puja Vidhanam into a documentary video. In this documentary video, we are trying to highlight the aspects of individual's unification with the nature and also the methodologies which will help one become pure and also get unified with the nature. Now, let us watch the trailer of Puja Vidhanam and this would be the last Sattva feature presentation for the day and after that we'll be moving on to the book launch and the panel discussion program. Thank you all. Over to the trailer of Puja Vidhanam. Thank you. Indian civilization values every individual as an expression of divine, thereby an epitome of bliss. Performing puja is an able instrument to discover the bliss held within each one of us. Puja is an act of honoring all the noble qualities present in the universe, thereby imbibe them into our routine. Puja is a pathway to experience oneness with the nature. To experience the oneness or unification with the universe and its beings, we require an engaging method that bridges the imaginary gap between us and the universe. As we all know, the body and mind are an amalgamation of the Panchabhutas. Now, if you expand this thought, you realize that Panchabhutas are fundamental to every creation around us, both animate and inanimate. What if we told you that the puja involves a cherishing and a charming conversation with the Panchabhutas? The procedures involved in puja will take us closer to a world that is familiar yet unknown. A mindful presence in the place of puja is the foundation upon which the entire edifice of puja is built upon. Further, each day, during the procedures of puja, we invoke the vast and accommodative space. Lively and vital wind, warm and unbiased fire, healing and purificatory water, and the ever hospitable and tolerant earth. Invocation of the five elements leads to a wholesome detoxification of the body and the mind. The purification attained further leads to the unification with the universe. Puja, embellished with the enlightening Vedic mantras, enchanting sound of the bell, aesthetically enriching kunkuma, turmeric and vermilion, sensory enhancing aromatic flowers, the fragrant sandalwood and empowering offerings consumed as prasada add a distinct flavor to the puja. This multi-sensorial experience enables perfect focus. Puja provides an opportunity to energize ourselves and experience moments of bliss in a life riddled with ups and downs. During the rituals, we invoke our nobility, virtues and best aspects of our personality onto the idol. This very action of invoking ideal qualities on an idol created of stone, metal or wood is a transformative experience when we realize it. Each passing day during the puja, we mirror or impose or invoke our ideal qualities onto the idol. Through this mirroring or invocation, we try to become sanctified. Thus, we would be able to receive back the constructive thoughts mirrored on the idol into ourselves. Achieving pure mind is a final destination of puja because in the pure mind alone shall reside nobility, thus paving the way for a higher possibility.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to felicitate our guests and few others who have made this event a reality. I heartily welcome our guests and panelists, Jay Sai Deepak and Mohan Das Pai, to join us on stage. I request Srimati Sumitra and Srimati Priyanka to escort our guests for both of us, please. I invite Sri Lakshmi Narayan, founder of Sri Parashara Gurukulam, to felicitate Padma Shri Sri Mohan Das Pai. Padma Shri Mohan Das Pai is the chairman of RN Capital Partners and he is a Bangalorean himself. Once again, a very, very warm welcome to both of you. Let's have a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. I now request Sri Lakshmi Narayan, the founder of Sri Parashara Gurukulam, to felicitate Padma Shri Sri Mohandas Pai, the chairman of RN Capital Partners, for all of you. Thank you. And now I request Mr. Srinivasan, an advocate, to felicitate J. Sai Deepak, the Supreme Court advocate and an author working on the variety of Indic causes and Indic welfare. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now I request Sai Deepak Ji to felicitate Praveen D. Rao, a man who has been supporting Satwa in all its endeavor right from its inception. Satwa, in collaboration with Praveen D. Rao and his team, designed and executed successfully the world's first Vedic concert. The journey thus far has yielded Satwa quality programs for all of you. Thank you. I now request Padma Shri Mohandas Pai to felicitate Kiran Ravindranath, the music director who has played an instrumental role in developing the Samskritam song which we witnessed a few moments ago. Kiran's journey with founding members of Satwa has been absolutely cherishing and memorable for all of us. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, now is the time that we all have been waiting for and now is the time that we are going to be unveiling the most amazing book we all have been waiting for. So yes, now we should acknowledge the unique fact that a young person like Jay Saidipak Ji, in the midst of all his hectic schedule has given us 
two books that can shake us up from our deep ignorant slumber and further lead us towards completeness. I think this occasion should not just inspire us to read, but also inspire us to write books that matter and take it to people who wish to evolve and reach the greater heights of life. And now I request Padma Shri Chivi Mohan Das Pai to launch the India, Bharat and Pakistan, the constitutional journey of a sandwich civilization. Jodh the Chapale Valley, ladies and gentlemen. Here we officially launch the most awaited book that we all have been waiting for. Let's keep clapping, let's keep roaring for this amazing book, which is India, Bharat and Pakistan, the constitutional journey of a sandwich civilization here officially launching for all of you. ಎಲ್ರಿಗೂ ಈ ಬುಕ್ ಇಂದ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಆಗ್ಲಿ ಶುಭು ಆಗ್ಲಿ ಅಂತ ನಾವೆಲ್ಲರೂ ಆಡಿಸೋಣ ಸೊ ಮತ್ತೊಮ್ಮೆ ಜೋರಾದ ಚಪಾಳೆ ಬರ್ಲಿ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಹಾರ್ಡ್ ಕಂಗ್ರಾಚುಲೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಎಂಟೈಯರ್ ಟೀಮ್ ಎಸ್ ವಿ ಒಫಿಷಿಯಲಿ ಲಾಂಚ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅಮೇಝಿಂಗ್ ಬುಕ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಭಾರತ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪಾಕಿಸ್ತಾನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ನಾವ್ ಮೂವಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ವರ್ಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಅ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ ಫುಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅ ಸ್ಕಾಲರ್ಲಿ ಪ್ಯಾನಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ as all of you can see we already have two scholarly panelist here with us and we will have mr neelakanthan who is going to be moderating the panel discussion for all of us mr neelakanthan who is into learning and development by profession and the brain behind devabhasha the world's first sanskrit card game and 108% indian and indian creativity toolkit and now over to neel yes okay so after the launch let's settle into a discussion on the book with uh, shri mohandas pai and uh, sai deepak so mohandas pai sir i want to start the first question with you as you read the book what were your takeaways and i'm asking you this in the context that you know we have learned a lot of things in history uh, somewhere at least when i read it these facts were not taught to us in history so as you read what were your takeaways when i read this book i was very happy because i have read a lot of history and what sai has done is to try to decolonize the indian mind and today i'm very happy to see this large crowd because i thought that a scholarly book of this nature on something called bharat which we are told is very communal doesn't fit with the idea of india i don't know whose idea of india is not to be seen by us and i'm very happy that so many young people are taking interest in themselves so this book recounts history from a particular point of time to another point of time to explain where we are at this point of time 
Now, this book is important because it recounts to us all that happened to create the current situation where we are. And I'm sure the series of books that he's writing, two of which are already out, will answer a very important question all of us want to know. Who are we? What are we? Where are we going? We are inheritors of a very old civilization, the only continuously living civilization in the history of the world. There were three large civilizations in the history of the world which have been there for a long time. One is the civilization around Mesopotamia, what is now Iraq, which led to the rise of the civilization in the Middle East, the Christianity, and others. Other is the Indic civilization around the Saraswati, the Ganges. These are all riverine civilization. And other is the Chinese civilization. Now, the civilization of the Middle East has marked over time, has been conquered or been converted to Christianity, and then the rise of Islam. And they've had great fights to dominate the world. And that civilization is based on the conquest of nature, on dogma, on the existence of one supposed God who seemed to exist, who nobody has seen, and to whom they must obey. Because the punishment for not obeying is to go to some hell, which nobody has been to, and that is a punishment that is there. So it is a closed system and a power center. And that power center, the Abrahamic religions, are the ones who try to dominate all of the religions. And they are the ones who have led the world to climate change and all the problems we have. The Indian civilization is the only civilization in the world where an individual has the freedom of thought, the freedom to seek, the freedom to go on his own journey because it told us that the end result of the journey is the same, but you have multiple paths and you're free to go. And it told us that you have to seek, you have to discover for yourself because the journey is the excitement of life. It's a very profound statement and a profound philosophy which gives us absolute freedom. It is the height of what people call a liberal, liberal society in the modern palace, right? And that society had to fight many colonial or many people coming to conquer because this society was a very rich society. On the Chinese side, there's been an old society which has gone to many phases. They had Confucius and the impact of Gautama Buddha, and they had their own civilization in their own light, and it's been continuous till the communists came and tried to destroy all that is past. But the Chinese are now rediscovering the past to show the world they're the Middle Kingdom and the ancient civilization, the own right, away from the West, and they shall rise again, so they're taking pride in their own culture. Now, when you come to India, where, you know, Sai Deepak is focused his attention on, why are we in this particular state we are? We have had interaction with multiple civilizations towards history. The first big civilization we had was the Greek civilization when Alexander came, and Alexander left after coming to India, and he treated Purushottama well after defeat. Then he went back, and the Hellenic civilization led to the upsurge of culture in the Khandara region, and they all assimilated to our civilization because they were smaller. And then, of course, the Greeks were decimated by the Christian uprising in Alexandria, where all these people destroyed the Greek culture to bring in this kind of a dogmatic, fundamentalist attitude of Christianity in that particular area and destroyed all traces of the Hellenic civilization. And I think that's a very important aspect that happened. Whereas in India, the first outward assault after the Greeks, where the Hunas had come in between, where by the Islamic contest. And the Islamic contest happened primarily because of the fact that there was an idea that they had one God and their God is the only God. So once you have one, one, one God and their God is the only God, you have to go conquer and tell everybody that you are superior. So it was a sign of contest. And that is a civilization which was based on shortages, a desert civilization, not the rich civilization on the reverse. So the only way they could grow was to kill others, subdue others, and do everything else. So there was religious fanaticism. It caused them to conquer. And they came to India. They went to uh, Iran and destroyed the, uh, the civilization there. And they went north to south, uh, to Central Asia, and they came to India and started fighting Indians. And Indians, being a Vedic civilization, fought them according to their rules and let them go. So we've seen Prithiraj Chavan many years, you know, defeating Ghazni and letting him go, didn't kill him, because that's not the nature of how we were the civilization. So this clash of civilization that happened in India 
is continuing today and that led to the domination so when an outsider comes to dominate you what do they do they destroy the symbols that keep it together so destroy all the temples they destroy our universities we had 13 great universities they destroyed all of them they never created a university sashi tarur should know and i'm somebody should ask him what did they create because sashi lies through his teeth they never created anything worthwhile except you know notch and mouth notch and mouth right and they came here and destroyed that and then they tried to suppress the great mass of people and here is where our deep culture and civilization stood at and we survived we survived a thousand years of onslaught and then came the british colonial regime which again tried to come and they came with the missionaries and they tried to convert there was a resistance because the islamic civilization was there and then we know what happened after that but after the fall on aurangzeb among the muslim community like sai deepak says there was a feeling of inadequacy because after aurangzeb fell uh, lost his empire due to the marathas who conquered them Baj bajira peshwa and others uh, you know if you read the history is fascinating history which has been hidden and then we saw the rise of revivalism where they wanted to create a pure islam whenever islam falls out of favor this uh, jihadis come up and try to create a pure revival where you go back to fundamental principles the sharia and all that because it is a complete court yet they say it's a religion of peace even though it tries to conquer others the barelvis and then come the ali brothers like yes elucidated and then comes the rise of aligarh so the continuing story of the fall of aurangzeb has to be in to create a islamic homeland because for them anything non islamic is not where they want to stay the idea is world conquest to make everything else that's why you see in places like uh, you know in scandinavia you see those pictures of people saying we are going to produce more children and going to take over your thing and we are going to win blah 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 they see them going to 10 downing street and say we are going to have sharia we are going to have this march in the street because that's what the book says so that's what they want to do now in india the marxists have written our history to say there's born homing among the suppressed and the oppressor now when the islamic rule was there we were the oppressed there's no J ganga jamuni tehzeeb and all this nonsense when I, mean, i said it out in a tv because you cannot have equality between an oppressor and the oppressed they're two different communities equality comes in a democracy where all of us are free which we are today and now that kind of a history was inculcated to say that hindus are communal and somebody else who is fundamentalist is not and that debate percolated into a constitution and we created a document and sai says it beautifully that the constitution of india is a document which is a result of western imperialism and the western thoughts the creation of the national nation states after the westphalia concord and the rise and domination of the west to the industrial revolution we led them to creating structures for global power in their world view and their world point because they were the conquerors they were the largest economy in the world and that led to the creation of the indian constitution which is a good document but it had vestiges of uh, imperial power uh, and the way that things are controlled and the ideas that kept us together the ideas of dharma and our culture was subjugated even though our constitution makers tried to do it and we tried to create a category of people called the minorities who are you know essentially uh, to show that we are so very generous and that is what is created a divide so i want to end by saying that i like this book because it takes us to the journey with facts and data tells us what happened and shows us the way to free our mind from all those narratives created by the marxists now why did the marxists create a narrative they created a narrative because the left failed in this country i mean in the west the industrial revolution came there was working class and they were the feudal class and the feudal class got his wealth from the land whereas then they became the capitalistic class and the subjugated workers if you read charles dickens you find out the horrors of the industrial revolution how children were made to work 14 15 hours and children died and yeah. they paid paltry wages that was the culture of the day uh, the so called free market economy and then they carried that forward so there was rebellion and marx created that uh, you know philosophy on this idea of communism to say that uh, the root cause of suppression of people is the ownership of land right in our culture uh, the most valuable thing was knowledge because in our culture the top of the social board was a scholar when the rajarishi came to the court 
the king came down, washed his feet, made him come, sit next to him, because the Rajarishi was the person who was supposed to have the power. And that's why in our culture, I'm sure you agree with me, Sai, the people who carry forward knowledge have to live in poverty. Because if the strength of the soldier and the knowledge comes in one person, you have destructive power like the President of the United States. A knowledge power, a powerful person who can press a button and blow up the whole world, with Putin too, threatens to do at any point of time. Right? But we understood the balance of power and said that this is what we to do. In your civilization, we said, we live in harmony with nature. Right? Harmony in nature because we take from nature what is required for survival, but not for our greed. And so we were a very harmonious culture where the greatest thing was to realize yourself and to attain moksha. It is not the attainment of power. It is not the attainment of wealth. It is not the attainment of great things. It is the attainment of respect, of people who come and respect you. Right? And now that has been suppressed by the Marxists who wrote her history to create a inadequacy in the Hindu mind to say that the idea of India is the idea of the modern Western world where a dominant uh, philosophy will prevail. And you have no culture, you have no history, you have no civilization, you have nothing else. And you are the outskirts. For them, being a fundamentalist is secularism and being a Hindu is being communal. So all that mess is there in the last 45 years. Now the last 10, 15 years, because of people like Sai Deepak, who probably have become uh, stuck with anger, I don't know whether you're angry, <laughs> or you know, uh, the frustration of seeing all this, uh, got him to leave his legal profession, work at night, like he says, and write this beautiful book. The series of three books will decolonize our mind. I'm sure that is his intent. And decolonize the mind means, makes us, gives us the facts, makes us understand what we are, to answer the question, and how do we relieve our culture? And the last point I want to make is, today India has become prosperous. That's why you have these young people. Yep. They're all there because they become prosperous, yep. they're proud of their country, they see India growing up, they got a lot of jobs, and they see a great future, they're not fighting for survival. And then India becomes a $5 trillion, $10 trillion economy in the next 10 years. They're going to stand up. And it's the right time that we have people like Sai to write with the power of the intellect, the power and the vigor of analytical thought and a lawyer's mind to answer all the criticism that could come from weak minds like Shashi Tharoor and others who are going <laughs> on that big campaign. It's a crazy campaign. For them, I think that campaign is the discovery of India. A very rich India from the India they created, India merged in poverty, India has become much richer. They'll be shocked when they come to Karnataka and go and see how well India has done. And that's why to me, this book is a very important aspect because it reveals the chain of history and decolonizes our mind and gives us the answers to what has happened today. Okay, thank you so much. I love the way you summarized all of history in about three to four minutes and then you got us from the journey to where we were to where we are. What I, uh, I've also read the book, but you have read the book very well. He summarized it extremely well. So thank you so much, uh, Mohandas Ji, for setting the tone for what I want to ask uh, Sai. Sai, the question is for you. History rewards those who have a long collective memory. Can you elaborate why do you say so? And Again, in the context of uh, Mohandas Ji just spoke about the history and all that, so if you could elaborate on that. See, uh, first of all, before I start, let me thank the organizers and Team Sattva for putting together such a fantastic event. Uh, I don't see the point in keeping this at the end of it. Volume. My audible? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, thanks to Bangalore for turning up in such huge numbers on a Sunday evening. <laughs> Sai, in Bangalore, we respect people with vidya, not money or political power. <laughs> so, in the last book tour, actually, Chennai happened to be the first outstation destination where I started the book tour, but this time I chose Bangalore for a very good reason after multiple experiences here. I was telling this to someone else that Bangalore, Mysore and Pune are an author's delight. Anyone who values knowledge and is looking for an audience which is interested in consuming that knowledge, these are the three cities at this point in Bharat which are actually welcoming such people. And therefore, the last two days, especially the book signing events of yesterday and, and even the interaction today and this particular event is proof of the fact that my, my belief has been validated. So thank you so very much for turning up here in such huge numbers. 
there is a reason why team satwa chose to air those three videos before the beginning of this particular event because you see i have said this before people like me and i wouldn't even consider myself in the particular bracket are perhaps secondary and tertiary scholars who are trying to clear the way for primary scholars who are producing this particular knowledge so you think of let's say uh, people like me as people who are cleaning the way and are filling the potholes so that this kind of vidya can finally find mainstream acceptance and thank you to these students who have turned up and have literally converted this into a patshala this is the second time this is happening with this book the first time this happened was at the book launch in delhi thank you for the humility and thank you for the patience what more can i say coming back to your question i think uh, the point i'm trying to make is the issue of historical amnesia which is what this community is currently let's say uh, in throes of it is grasit to use sanskrit it is literally in the in the clutches of this particular amnesia and every time you tend to forget history someone who is actually the aggressor gets to walk away with the fact that he has committed that and then turn around and fashion his own history and you lose the right to actually paint yourself as a victim you don't even need to paint yourself as a victim you don't get to tell your story as a victim that is the current state of affairs in bharat so i'll give you a very short uh, primer here see in the immediate aftermath of the partition in 1947 the muslim community was under a terrible degree of guilt because they understood the blame for the partition must lay at the doors of the founder of the two nation theory and those who took it forward which is sayed ahmed khan and everybody else and therefore jinnah and therefore to compensate for that yusuf khan became dilip kumar because they realized that the public sentiment was still significantly or rather the 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 genocide of partition was still in fresh in public mind so this is what happened now that is being painted as bharat's ganga jamuni tehsil in action and composite culture in action no it's not it is someone who is buried under a guilty conscience knowing fully well that the only way that he can find public acceptance is by blending in and that was a time when a significant let's say portion of the muslim population had already gone there and those who stayed back despite having voted for pakistan suddenly overnight became bharatiyas and they decided to let's say stay back in this country the demographic position was still not that strong in 1947 now compare 1947 and 2022 now look at the way it is all being projected in the very same industry in the very same industry called bollywood now you have someone valorizing underworld dons such as uh, uh, rashid latif and that movie called rise was released these are the kind of examples now that is a very clear pointer to two things one the demographic balance has started tilting in their favor and therefore you will see a very conscious assertion of that particular identity at three different levels societal political and at the pop culture level this is what you are seeing i wouldn't necessarily look at the situation that we currently live in in terms of the beheadings and everything else as a reflection of any particular flash point or the trigger of a particular event or the reaction to a particular event according to me it was waiting to happen and perhaps there was only the need for a particular opportunity or a trigger which could help them paint themselves as victims now that has come about and therefore a long awaited plan has been set in motion which is why i have consciously said that we are currently living in the age of khilafat 2.0 the problem is they understand it so beautifully but on this side there is no realization of the thought continuum and therefore you are looking at isolated instances as opposed to connecting the dots so i'll give you a simple example uh, china around uh, the galwan period and i think 2018 19 its 
mouthpieces had started talking of a two and a half war. Yeah. They were referring to some wars in the past, including, including the Dogra General Zoravar Singh's capture of Tibet. Mm. So when they are referring to that, that is one war. The half war that they are referring to is 1962 because it was not full. They had to stop it. So you see, you're surrounded by people whose memories are fantastic. China has a great... You, communism, according to me, has only translated to consolidation of the Chinese entity and revival of its civilizational consciousness, which is the exact opposite of communism's effect in Bharat. So, on one hand you have this, and on the other hand you have Pakistan and then Bangladesh. Both of them may be, as some people believe, of the same DNA, but I don't think DNA makes a difference. What makes a difference is the thought process of the, soft, of the software, so to speak. Both of them see a continuity from Bin Qasim to Muhammad Ali Jinnah and thereafter. Here, barring a few islands and pockets, who you are and where you come from is a question that most people flounder, flummox, and completely get flustered by. They have no idea what they're talking about. Because any identity that you subscribe to is looped back to your caste identity and therefore there is a stick to beat you with and therefore you are guilt tripped into it. You have found multiple ways of, let's say, guilt tripping you to ensure that the name Hindu doesn't come out from your mouth. So what I have tried to show through the course of this book is if there is a fond hope in our head spaces that Pakistan will self-destruct and implode, it will not. Even if it breaks, it has created a Rakta Bija Rakshasa. I've mentioned that specifically. Yes. Which is to say that with every drop of blood, a new seed is born. And therefore, according to me, yeah. and therefore, according to me, Bharat has no other option but to reconnect to its roots not in the interest of academic pursuit of decoloniality, but in the interest of survival, civilizational survival, societal survival, and personal survival. We are looking at an existential situation. So this book is not meant to be an academic exercise in finding out what happened when. It is to ask yourself, why did it happen? And do the very same causes and reasons and factors survive? In which case, what have we made of history and the lessons it is offering you? And why are we so blind to the lessons of history where it is being offered on a platter thanks to the incidents of the present? That has been the attempt here. So that line that you read out is to basically say the one with the strongest will and the longest memory will always be the one who survives. That in a nutshell is the task forward for Bharatiyas. I am tempted to ask both of you this question and uh, I would like you to answer it from an inward perspective as to why is it that we find it so difficult to have a long collective memory despite being such a such civilization of such length? Uh, quick response from the two of you if you can. Look, we do have a long collective memory. The Rig Veda is still recited, the Gita is still recited, so our cultural artifacts are still recited. The rest of this conquest and everything else, we tend to forget because we have been humiliated, we have been defeated, and we are lost out. So we go back to the past and look at these cultural artifacts. But now once you become prosperous, all that comes alive. And I think it's important for people to understand. And the reason is very clear to me. Never again should we be conquered. Now I'm a Konkani. We are people of the Saraswati River. After the river dried up, we went east to, you know, Bengal and we came down the coast. We were in Goa, Gomantak. We were brutalized by the Portuguese. The Portuguese killed my forefathers, destroyed our temples. My family temple has been destroyed near Ponda. It is there. But why is there no outcry against the Portuguese? There are Christian priests there who abuse Manohar Parikar and pass and everybody stands up for them. And we celebrate Francis Xavier's embalmed body, whereas you are the one who called the Inquisition. The Goa Inquisition was one of the most barbaric intrusion 
of human beings which led to torture and killing on an epic scale. It happened over a period of time. That has been whitewashed from my history. Why whitewash? Because they don't want to remember because they believe that you are going to be a different person. But look at the Jews. They keep the Holocaust alive. Why is that? Because they want to tell everybody that look, never again should it happen because once the collective memory is lost, when you see the signs of something, you don't understand the signs and you can be subject to subjugation again. Never again should India be conquered. Never again should it be subjugated because the subjugation happens slowly as it's happening right now and that should be stopped. And that's why his book is important because all these young people here should understand who they are, what they are. Inner it is a great civilization. They must become global figures. They must become economically well-loved like the Jewish community in America and conquer the world and control the world's global power and that thereby the narrative control the media. That's why, you know, a channel in New Delhi being bought over by a Gujarati is fantastic, right? That's the way you got to do it. Because please remember, the Gujus know how to do it, huh? not Kannadigas. Kannadigas are very <laughs> papam nice people. Uh, Tamilians are a lost case, so you know, Sai should come here. They've got to fight a lot. But you must understand one important thing. The future lies in knowledge. The future lies in economic power. And that is what we must use to our benefit. And the day we lost that knowledge, that the knowledge diluted, and the day we lost economic power was the day of the beginning of a downfall. Mm. But we have survived. We're the only old civilization that has survived continuously in human history. And we can't let it go. And now we see these threats. We are seeing what Huntington said, the clash of civilizations. Yeah. Yeah. It's happened in India for a long period of time. It's happening now. The West is in decline. China is ascendancy, but the population will decline. India is in ascendancy. And the forces of fundamentalism, of revivalism from the Middle East, particularly the Wahhabism is coming, though I would like Sai to study what Salman, Prince Salman is doing because he is feeling his hegemony and his control with all the money from the Middle East will be lost in case he promotes Wahhabism because he wants to have a good quality of life for himself. So we're going to see all this mix. And for us to prosper, Understand who you are, what you are, why things happen, keep the memory alive so never again can somebody conquer you and be a free citizen and grow up to dominate the world and become a truly global power. Thank you. Uh, so I want to also, wanted to also respond to the piece where Mohandas Ji says, we remember the Rig Vedas, we remember that, but somehow we seem to have lost what has happened in between. And I want to ask you why that is, why do you think that is the case? See, there are two aspects to it. One, you have to realize that when you speak of India and Bharat, you are referring to two parallel realities in existence. So Bharat exists in those pockets where the Vedas are seen as the enumeration of our journey apart from being our scripture. And therefore that unbroken tradition continues. And then there is the segment that lives in India that effectively believes that we are the product of a synthetic exercise that was undertaken by the colonizer. Now, if Bharat were to prevail over India and had taken the reins of power in 1947, the story would have been very different. But. India took over the reins and prevailed over Bharat. And the, the, the blame for this, if you have to look at the analysis of it, and I've run to some extent in the book, is the success of the Western colonizer or the Christian colonizer is in the co-option of the elites by presenting his life as the aspirational model or the destination for all of us to reach and therefore also treating Western education as the means to that particular aspirational end. And therefore he determines two aspects, the goal as well as the means. What more remains? And therefore when the elites of the Hindu society adopt that particular way of life and embrace it as if it's their own, and they also start believing in the Aryan invasion theory, which reflects including in your academic literature of that particular period, you have surrendered your cultural independence at the feet of a colonizer 
who succeeded in convincing you that he and you come from the same racial stock. Now that particular segment goes on to then take over the reins of power, then crafts a separate elite that starts writing textbooks where history is not narrated, history is invented. No wonder you are where you are. Which is exactly why I'm trying to show in the book that India and Bharat are two streams that continuously flow from the 1880s onwards, clearly making the point that the Congress is representing India and let's say revolutionaries and the extremist stroke nationalists of the particular period were representing Bharat through their own speeches and writings as to how they were drawing inspiration for their struggle through the ethos of Bharat and through Shakta worship or Shakti worship. That tells you that there is an internal tussle. Whereas that internal tussle is absent in the Muslim community or at least was absent in the Muslim community as a consequence of which there is a greater coherence in that particular vision. I also show that Sayyid Ahmad Khan and Raja Ram Mohan Rai must be seen as their respective representatives for the Muslim and Hindu community in terms of who and what is a reformer for each of these communities and what is the end goal of the particular reform. Raja Ram Mohan Rai encouraged people to take up English education and did not encourage them to parallelly learn their Hindu education. He asked them to junk it all together, goes on to then reinvent a new form of Hinduism called Brahmoism which is refashioned on biblical lines, or at least on Christian lines, Sayyid Ahmad Khan effectively says, I will learn English only for the purposes of taking back state power and for nothing else, to navigate the colonial system. He takes that position categorically. He makes that statement without mincing words and I've extracted that particular portion also. So one is learning English to merely navigate the system so that you know how to present your position in the most articulate manner possible in the contemporary world. The other is to drown yourself in English to the extent that you sever yourself from your roots. The first is the example of the Muslim, the second is the example of the Hindu. That is the position. Anybody else who's managed to survive the ravages of English education despite the education system is either because of his cultural moorings where he's part of an extended community or family or whatever it is. But all of that is a matter of chance. It's not a matter of design. You should be lucky if you're born in a particular family or a community which still takes its Hindu roots seriously. Therefore, your Hindu identity survives despite the education system. But assume for a moment that your family equally has bought into that education system, you've had it. You've had it. There is no way you'll reconnect to your roots. If, the, if you were to come from that particular background, the first three videos will be accused of Brahminical patriarchy. Yes. Will be accused of superstition. Yes. Will be accused of, 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 let's say, deifying mythology. Yes. Even the most indic-minded of Hindus continue, continue to use the word mythology in the context of Puranas. Yes. That is the problem. Yes. We have struck a very clear distinction between Etihasa and Purana. Yeah. And that distinction is not the same as history and mythology, by the way. It is not. Yeah. Etihasa is not history. Where, because we subscribe to a greater objective narration of facts, thus it happened is effectively the translation of Itihasa as opposed to interpolating it with your own opinions. You want examples? The examples must be from our greatest of epics, where even the tallest of heroes of each of these epics, their grey sides are shown, leaving it to the audience to draw their own inference in terms of character assessment. Whether it's Lord Rama or Dharmaraj Yudhishthira, that difference, I mean that, let's say the multiple sides of their personality is exposed leaving it to people to interpret it according to what they want. That is not the way history is written under the European lens. But there is a reason for it. If you have invented a faith system through a parliament and then, let's say, disseminated throughout the world, propaganda is at the heart of your belief system. Invention of history is at the heart of your belief system. Which is why you're going to struggle when archaeology suddenly throws up details or let's say with the evidence that all the legends that you have managed to create around one particular faith system, did it have any basis in evidence in the first place? Or was it folklore which was adopted and then conveniently used for consolidation of power? That's not the case here. Almost everything that our Etihasa say will be supported by evidence, archaeological evidence and linguistic evidence.
that much is very very clear so around the let's say the the myth of immaculate conception what not the so called rationalists from their side themselves say this such a census never happened there was no movement at all from bethlehem to jerusalem or whatever it is that is the position that they have started taking but here you are suppressing the archaeological evidence precisely because it meets with the scriptural evidence that that speaks volumes of it because you have to realize the the test according to me lies in the extent of detail in both the epics where from cities to lifestyles to culture to language to food and everything is described in clear detail clearly showing that you are not leaving any particular aspect of that particular history or time period to imagination you are able to do so precisely because you are able to relate to the reality as it existed then which is why the epics are so detailed if you want to get a clear picture as to the culinary habits of the particular period you can get it if you want to talk about let's say uh any uh, any event such as an eclipse or so on and so forth you get it so i come from the school of thought which shuns the use of the word mythology under any circumstances as far as bharat's itihasas and puranas are concerned now this you will see in the battle of historians in the 1800s and 1900s where india and bharat were fighting each other the traditional school of history of bharat starts with the end of the mahabharata war and from there it calculates the the lineages of di dynasties you will subscribe to that notion provided you believe in the historicity of the mahabharata and from there you say all those characters did have successors and descendants but should you choose to merely treat them as epics and mythical epics then from there you have effectively junked the direct lineage and successors altogether so this according to me tells me that there is a continuity of tradition without a doubt but the continuity of tradition is not the dominant let's say narrative of hindus it is the tradition which is actually trying to breathe it is grasping it's gasping for breath and finally it has found some breathing space which is evidenced by this audience which is evidenced by the support that works of vikram sampat and others have finally got according to me the success of bharat will lie or will be reflected on that day on the beautiful day hopefully when we are no more fighting on current history or let's say so called modern history but you actually have a mainstream audience discussing the ethnographic details of our epics and those scholars find mainstream purchase which means people like me should be rendered obsolete and we should move off the stage because our job would have been done with that the purpose of our existence is over thank you actually all that you spoke led me to a range of questions hopefully i'll ask the ask the right one so just before the panel discussion started i was uh, having a quick conversation with mohanda ji and i asked him did they teach you this in history because this was not taught to me in my history our history was all about mughal glory and what not so my question and i think you are the first person who's referred to mughal rule as middle east colonization in your book i don't think i have seen this have you ever seen this text anywhere no so i don't think we have seen it anywhere and what i hear you say just now is we have done this ourselves and i and i don't know how to how to word it but if it was so evident how could we just teach ourselves the wrong history and what were we waiting for you know you must understand that life is a power struggle there is a set of people who came to power in delhi after the whites anglicans left how do they dominate the indian mind if they liberate the indian mind by going back to bharat then there could be an awakening and they may be eased out so they had to continue the same tradition creates lutian delhi to tell the rest of us the new idea with they were propagating right and to me in some way it was a fight between gandhi ji's idea of india and nehru's idea of india nehru's idea of india was very european not indian he was the son of a rich man where gandhi took on the garb of a poor indian to reach out to all indians and let me say this sai tell me if i'm wrong gandhi was the one political leader who traveled all across india to see what india was after that narendra modi is the only leader who has done that <laughs> i don't think any other of course now we have a 
young man trying to go up in his uh, caravan and all that beautiful thing <laughs> talking to George. 50 year old youth icon sir. Huh? 50 year old youth icon. Yeah, George Puvaiya. No, what is that? George Papaya. What is his name? George. I think George Ponnaiya. George Ponnaiya. George Ponnaiya. Yeah. By God. And you know, getting into trouble all the time and all that. But you see, life is a power struggle. How do you control the minds of people? Rewrite their history. Deny them their past. Recreate everything in your vision to keep there. But, like he said, Bharat is still there in our hearts. Bharat lives with us every single day. So the veneer of something that has been put into your mind has to be removed. I mean, look, I started looking at all this after I left Infosys because they're so busy trying to earn a living. Yeah. And I'm discovering myself. My children are more Indian than me, more of Bharat than me. Why? Because they didn't have to struggle for a living and be subjected to all this because they're questioning who they are and what they are and they're very proud of the culture. All these young people here are very proud of what they are because they're not fighting for survival. They're not subjugated. They have no memories of the colonial past except the memories of Lutyens Delhi trying to impose their views on them and they find it so funny. The debate about intolerance, uh, the debate about those uh, vandalism attacks, the debate about flying the flag, they all laugh at them and that shows that the that the people who control you from Delhi, and Delhi is the epicenter of all evil in this country. Because that's where it is concentrated, right? And now Modi is trying to remove that by putting Subhash Chandra Bose right there. Right there. Everybody sees him. Right? And then creating that Karavya Park, saying Kattavya Path and all that, and a new parliament. It's taken 75 years to go to parliament. And I read the side that parliament building was lower than the north block and the south block. Right. Because to show that there is this big Buddha called the Rashtrapati Bhavan, Vice Regal Raj, standing on top of the Raisina Hill, Correct. dominating India. Then there are these two wings dominating everybody else, sign of imperial power. Then there's a parliament lower down, uh, which is a sign of these people dominating the people of this country. And then you have the king emperor sitting down there and showing with the middle finger. Right? Now all that has to go, and this is all a part of colonization, so it's a power struggle. Now what we have to do, we've got to produce scholars like Sai Deepak, who is uh, very secure in his own skin. He doesn't suffer from the inadequacies of the previous generation, the insecurities of who they are, very secure, very knowledgeable, extremely well read, and he can argue it out with anybody on any point, on TV or otherwise. A Vikram Sampath who does research the way research has to be, not the stories that uh, Romila Thapan and others write in JNU. And uh, many others, uh, like Amish Tripathi and others, who are very proud. I mean, I'm, I'm, honestly, I've seen the last three generations. I'm very proud of the generation because they're so very happy, I mean, so very secure, so very confident. They've got all the facts, and you can't rubbish them. And you have a Shashi Taru who lies to his teeth. They're a bit confused about what. You know, uh, Sai, Shashi made a remark about the Mughals. He said that the British came and took away India's wealth and looted. True. The Mughals did not loot. They stayed here and did everything. But he forgot one important thing. 1732, Nadir Shah came to India and took away all the wealth of India because the, British, the Mughals had looted the whole country, kept the wealth in Delhi. An invader came and took away. I was in Tehran, in the central bank of Tehran. They got a treasure chest you know, as big as this room, where you've got huge treasure chest of gold, diamonds, rubies, or precious cone, the peacock throne, everything there. And they show a big uh, mosaic of how Nadi Shah went and defeated Humayun, I think, or somebody, Humayun, no, gave a shelter to Humayun and defeated the Mughal king and went. They let the money go. I mean, it's as good as a loot. So all this idea of the great Mughals, Mughal rule of India being benevolent, the roads in Delhi, Aurangzeb Road, Akbar Road, my God, there's no country where you put the name the roads in the name of your conquerors, like India. I mean, has anybody put a Hitler's road in uh, Poland, a road after Adolf Hitler? They are not, right? We still have the Queen statue in Bangalore, right? Near, uh, uh, you know, near this uh, Kabam Park and all that. So I think it's a fight for the Indian mind. So we need scholars that Sai will do research, will talk about it, and then other scholars will come up. But all of you should buy his book. If you don't buy his book, and his book does not go to 60,000, 70,000. Ramchandra Goa will come and say that nobody reads him. Because that's the battle of numbers. 
That's the battle of numbers. And the numbers must be published. You must tell us how many copies of your first book sold and how many copies second book is going to sold. Sure. And between the three of them, you must have five lakh books. And by, by 2025, but everybody reads the book. And I think, no, I'm saying this seriously because we are in a situation where there's a battle for the Indian's mind, your minds. Our minds are, you know, contaminated now opening up because of him. So once you people understand, are ingrained and know the truth and do your own research. Please remember, in the Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna, Sri Krishna tells Arjuna the Gita and explains to him, he says, O Partha, I told you all I know, but now it's up to you to accept not to accept, to discover for yourself. He doesn't say, I have said this, obey, tremble and obey. No. If you don't obey, you go to hell. No, no, no. He said, this is my saying to you. Now you understand, you accept, don't accept, do what you want. That is the freedom. That is the freedom all of you must protect. That is the freedom which makes India, Bharat what it is. That's the freedom we must strive for. And that's the freedom must be protected and passed on from generation to generation. Because that is the freedom which is going to give us liberation and make us free people. Not this dogma of the Abrahamic religions or the dogma of Lutian's Delhi. Thank you. Uh, so Actually, if I have the time, I want to ask about Mohandas Pai and Shashi Tharoor. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Um, let me start with the figures and then I'll connect it to the question that you've asked. Yeah. One is thus far the first book has sold close to uh, one lakh copies for a wow. dry, uh, <laughs> legally written, non-fiction book which That's makes for dense reading. Which is why I said that the credit goes to the circumstances. The stars are aligning for the success of these books. So th therefore the credit goes to them. <laughs> Second, social media has enabled it significantly. You have to give credit to that. Because according to me, see, I, I told you this uh, last time also that my calculation was very simple. If I have about three and a half or three, three and a half lakh followers on Twitter, on LinkedIn, that's about another half a lakh followers or even more. Facebook, approximately half that number. I effectively said that even if I write garbage and 25% of it buys it, I'll still reach it. Simple. Yeah. If, if it's a question of number game, that's how you reach the bestseller category. Ram Goa has got larger numbers than you, them two and a half, three million. I mean, he has not sold enough books like you. <laughs> that's because the Overton window has, has shifted and people have started realizing it. And all of us are reaping the benefit of it actually. And therefore, there is a willing audience and fortunately, there are people who are willing to produce it also. The second book, usually the first print run has about 5,000 to 10,000 copies, but because of the captive audience and the market feedback, in terms of the anticipation of the second book, they published about 25,000 copies in the first print run itself. Okay. Wow. Out of which Amazon itself has bought close to 9,000. Okay. And the rest has gone to Crossword, Subna, and everybody else. This is broadly the figure. Uh, in America, as far as the first book is concerned, it was in the constitutional category on Kindle uh, in the top 10 for close to eight months. Wow. Wow. So people there were reading it. Kindle numbers are good here. Now let me connect that to the question. Okay. Yes. The battle at this point is being led by the children of the late 80s and the yes. early 90s. Yeah. 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 Vikram, others and all of us. Because we have seen what we have witnessed and experienced on college campuses and schools and other places. Yeah. Right? And therefore, when finally Niyati has provided you an opportunity to give it back, we are giving it back with interest. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Two, it's easier to blame the previous generations, but you see they were stuck in the Nehruvian growth model. Yeah. Yeah. Now that according to me was by design, mm. was to reduce the economic morale yeah. of Hindus and to call it the Hindu, Hindu growth rate. Growth. Yeah. Okay. Assuming that you had witnessed liberalization well before 1991, my hunch is that this renaissance would have happened faster and quicker. Mm, okay. Because Maslow's basic needs would have been fulfilled and then you're ready for the next level of the battle. That's exactly what Mr. Pai is saying. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. When your parents are trying to, let's say, they're struggling to provide for you and you're trying to live in a, in a joint family for multiple reasons. One, that's been your culture until then. And second, joint family also translates to economies of scale. You're able to save 
more, you're able to spend less, the cost is dissipated. All that happened, right? And if Bharat had embarked on, if not Western style capitalism, but a Bharatiya style humane capitalism in a slightly different way much earlier, I suspect that all of this would have happened faster and quicker. Mm. Maybe the textbooks would have changed, thereby obviating the need for these kind of books in the first place. That's point number two. Point number three is um, there is something happening which cannot be explained through logic at all, whatsoever. I don't think the fate of this country is going to be decided anymore by elections alone. Because there's a massive upsurge of civilizational consciousness where there's a sudden explosion of scholars of all ages. There is a 18-year-old uh, blogger, or rather not blogger, a podcaster by the name Anvesh Sapati. I usually mention people so that people know who they are and what they do. He's basically an Odia. I don't know where he's based out of. This 18-year-old boy did such a fantastic job of going through the first book and raising some of the most scintillating questions anybody has asked me with respect to the first book, which was fundamentally theoretical in nature. Okay. And he was happy that I was quoting Balagangadra. That means he had already read Balagangadra. 18-year-old hmm. boy. The book was meant for people in that particular age bracket starting from 18 onwards and hoping that they would be able to relate to it because I'm not trying to be condescending here, the language is not easy. That's, yeah. I blame it on my, let's say, my training as a lawyer. I've changed gradually in the second book. People yes. will see the difference in the style of writing. Yes. Shorter sentences, yes. multiple punctuations have gone. Yes. Right? yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the excessive use of comma and semicolons have gone. <laughs> exactly, the need to confuse is gone. Because the first book was meant to send a message that was done, but now that the, the theory is out, the practical started. That tells me that so many youngsters are taking an active interest yeah. in Chennai, in Delhi, and in uh, Bangalore and other places. People who previously were of clear leftist Marxist persuasion, youngsters, have come to me and said, we have watched your videos during the course of the lockdown and then the book, we don't believe in what we believed earlier. Wow. That's why I said that the lockdown was a blessing. If you remember the last occasion, yes. I remember I said the yes. lockdown was a fantastic blessing. It was a tipping point for the civilization mm. because it gave people an opportunity to stay with, uh, within their homes. And when you're inside, you have to do something. Because you see, as long as you're pursuing a material life, you're not going to look inward. And you're constantly busy trying to earn. When anyway that door has been shut, you'll have to do something. There are two options. You eat, eat and eat and put on weight. <laughs> or you start looking inward and start developing certain spiritual practices. Mm. And the simultaneous hearing of Mahabharata, Chanakya and Ramayana at the same time did a lot of things. <laughs> so credit goes to the government for having realized that this was a window of opportunity to bring back that golden age of Doordarshan television and introduce this generation to it. Mm. I don't know who thought of it, but this was according to me among the few times that Chanakya Niti was actually in action. <laughs> so. I think the only thing that we may have to be slightly careful about at this point is given the explosion of consumer choices, mm -hmm. one is to satisfy your needs and the second is to go down the path of rampant consumerism. This city may want to consider this. Certain pockets of the city may want to consider this particular piece of suggestion that's coming, may not be a comfortable suggestion. Just hold on to your, your youngsters. Bangalore is well poised to be the intellectual capital and the epicenter of Bharatiya Indic Renaissance. Yeah. Yeah. You have the demographic advantage. You have a fantastic readership. There is pra practically no art form which has no performer or let's say an audience here. Yeah. Right? Don't lose this advantage. You can do what Madras was at one point to the southern part of the country. Unfortunately, it is no more. The transition from Madras to Chennai is the transition from an enlightened audience to Dravidianism. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I just hope that that virus doesn't infect the Honorable Kanadigas. <laughs> please protect yourself. Coming from a Tamilian, please accept it. <laughs> you know, I just want to add. Sure. Uh, 
The night of 14th August 1947, Nehru stood up in parliament and said, the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance. It happened in 2014 actually. Oh. <laughs> it didn't happen in 1947. The soul of Bharat long suppressed didn't find utterance. It didn't. Because we are still suppressed by Lutyens Delhi. But 2014 happened because for the first time we had a government of the people, by the people, for the people. That means of Bharat, for Bharat, by Bharat. I'm honestly saying it having seen all this government because for the first time the focus was on Bharat. Not this Western notion of India. There's nothing wrong with the Western notion of India. It's fine. We know how to handle that. But we've got to focus on the people. And this dispensation has given every Indian the basic necessities of life. Toilets, water, power. So we are now coming to a stage when all Indians have the necessities of life. A new generation has come up. Jobs are plenty. The economy is growing. On the economy, I want to give you data because what he said is very poignant. In 19... 50, when he got a constitution, India was the richest country in Asia. Japan was destroyed, China was destroyed, Southeast Asia was destroyed. Great Britain owed us 1.5 billion pounds for the war effort. The currency of India was very strong. I think the dollar rupee rate was 1 to 1 or something like that. Right? Nehru oppressed Indian capital. India throughout history was a rich nation because we had skilled people, we are exporters, we were rich, we are traders, and we traded with everybody, we had economic freedom. He suppressed the Indian capitalistic class, Indian capital, promoted public sector. It's fine to promote public sector. He tried the Fabian model and the Soviet model, which was failing by that point of time. So for 30 years from their side, India grew at 3.5% a year with the communist Raj Krishna said Hindu rate of growth. Maybe it was deliberate, I don't know. In population grew at 2.5 percent, and by 1980, from the richest country in Asia, we became the poorest country. Yeah. In 1980, we opened up. We grew at 5.5 percent a year from 1980 to 1990, and then debt went up from 20 billion dollars to 80 billion dollars. It was fueled by foreign debt, and population grew only at 2.25 percent. Income grew at 3.25 percent, as against 1 percent a year for 30 years. So we were impoverished. We were poor deliberately when the world grew. So our idea of India was gone down. We were a failed country. When I graduated in 1979 with a BCom, you know, the movie Diwar showed us what the angry young man and the failure. And in Diwar, they wrote about Billah 786, which protects him when somebody shoots at him, because that is the Islamic narrative. And he goes to the temple and fights with Lord Shiva, whoever, Sri Shiva, whoever it is, to show anger, because, you know, you are failed. And I'm here only successful because I had Billa 786 where somebody shot me and protected me. The Chacha is a good man and you're all evil. I mean, remember that? Correct. So yeah. Bollywood did that to destroy our culture. Now we are finding out that's why Brahmasra should go. <laughs> they, it should all go. They should destroy that. Okay. Now, when we opened up in 91, you must listen, when we opened up in 91, our GDP was $275 billion. Today, in 2022, we are $3.16 trillion. Yeah. We have grown at 8.2% a year for 31 years. Per capita income has gone up by 6.6% .6 a year for 31 years. And will grow at 8 to 8.5% a year in dollars for the next 10, 15 years. Now, that unbelievable growth has created the circumstances for this generation to come up with great hope. You understand? Yeah. When my generation was in college, our forefathers tell us the British ruled India better. Yes. The streets were cleaner. Yes. The they gave us railways. <laughs> it's actually so because the British person who ruled Bangalore used to go for inspection of all the drains because there's something called drain inspectors here. And in the morning, he used to go for muster at 630 to make sure the city was clean. And the city was cleaner. The commissioner now never goes for inspection, doesn't even know the city. And this whole area has become very corrupt. And Gandhi called the Simon Commission report a drain inspector's report. So this pros economic prosperity is the key to resurgent India, to the rediscovery of, to the discovery of Bharat again for all this young generation and for the future. But like Sai said, that energy must be channelized into becoming a knowledge power. You must get proper education, proper values to becoming an economic power and dominating the globe because we are 17% of humanity. We are 17% of humanity. We have given humanity some of the greatest discoveries of humankind. The answer to the question, 
who am I and where am I going, what is the purpose of life which nobody has given. Others have given only dogma, we have liberated the human mind. And I think what he said, I want to give you data. Yeah, so I think you actually summarized uh, a lot of things that we have spoken about, and I think I've been I've been said that we are running out of time. Uh, I think this is a panel discussion that can continue for hours, and I have a lot of questions to ask. But uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you one question, Sai Deepak. Decolonializing, where do we begin? Short response: Past, present, and future. Where do we begin? So I think the obvious response is in textbooks, but that's a very distant response. My your volume. It's not a response which is capable of finding purchase because you see, when you look at a particular problem and you offer a solution, a solution that is most proximate to your life, which you can perform consistently on a daily basis, is the most empowering solution possible. So long as, let's say, that one fine day arrives when we are looking at all these sweeping policy changes. I have basically said, if you remember the last time, that you start with language. Yes. Yeah. You start with your personal practice. And the human mind is such that once certain connections are created, those connections automatically create further connections. It has its own way of progressing. There is a reason why you're looking at artificial intelligence because the nature of human intelligence is it is, it is subconscious and unconscious without you having to work on those connections. It starts building on its own. The day I think we start looking at our native literature, at our native language, and also hopefully connect with the Ganga of Bharatiya civilization, or perhaps the Saraswati of Bharatiya civilization, which is the native tongue with Sanskrit. And you start doing that. And this becomes more or less, at the very least, the, 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 the medium of instruction as well as the medium of communication in most places. There is a decent chance that from a perspective of confidence and from the perspective of having people, resources, to actually uh, research on these aspects, you'll have more options. See, one of the biggest things that you're going to face today and this is something that uh, Sri Michel Danino said, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, in one of his speeches, after he retired from the Indian Council for Historical Research, that we don't have people who know Indian languages. Yes. We don't have people who know epigraphy yeah. or who know how to read stone inscriptions. There's a fantastic article that Sandeep Balakrishna has written perhaps two weeks ago on yes. what is going to be the status of Indic research yes. over the course of the next 25 years yes. uh, on his blog, uh, Dharma yeah. Dispatch. Yeah. That's a must read according to me. Because while we are fat, uh, fighting this ideological battle, the actual thing is Bija Raksha and protection of the particular knowledge system, yes. the original source. Yes. For that, we don't have trained people. So I am hoping that more and more people will move towards primary research, yes. will move towards those options. So yesterday, I had a fantastic email on LinkedIn from a person who is based out of, I think, either Australia or America. They had all the option and all the opportunity in the world to send their daughter in the STEM direction. He has sent his daughter to Bharat to collect manuscripts, Sanskrit manuscripts, and to help in its digitization as well as in terms of creating a database of sorts. That's a fantastic initiative. Because that effectively tells me that the NRI community, which, whose affluence levels are better than Bharatiya's in general, so to speak, has now realized that it is time to pay back to the motherland in this particular fashion, as opposed to earning further greenbacks, assuming that from America. So that is a great movement forward. The exhortation that I've urged them to focus on over the last three or four years is finding some purchase there. I'm not going to take credit for it. There's a decent chance they already thought of it. But they've also realized that there are enough voices to support such movement. Yeah. This, according to me, is, is a huge beacon of hope. I hope that our demographic dividend that we currently enjoy is channeled in three directions. Mm -hmm. One, strategic studies, index studies, and knowledge studies, which is to say you need to capture all three. Because as much as there is a cause for hope, there, is also, there are also serious concerns. Yeah. So I'll give you one short example and I'll leave it at that. Last evening I was traveling with a friend. I hadn't heard of this artist called Amrita Venkatesh and her rendition of this song, uh, Vishweshwara. Okay. The way she sung it and the way she is connected both the technical nuances as well as the bhava of that particular rendition the only thought that my friend and I had was, this is what we are fighting to protect. Wow. Okay. This is the thing we are fighting to protect. That there are people to pursue it and that this knowledge tradition is kept alive. So then both of us arrived at the same conclusion that at a time when social media is giving us an opportunity to showcase the true depth of Bharat's history and its culture, you are also going through a serious demographic battle. Yeah. 
and serious civilizational battle from all sides. Yeah. According to me, it's a make or mar movement for Bharat. This is the second crossroad movement for Bharat in terms of choosing its way forward. And therefore, I hope we don't make the mistakes of the 1920s and hence the connection in that book. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a very inspiring closure and I hope that we take back this. This is a make or mar movement from the 1920s to the 2020s. We have yet another chance and I hope we make the most of it. So on behalf of the audience, thank you so much Sai Deepak and Mohandas Pai for, for, the, for this wonderful panel discussion. I hand it over back to Navyata. Thank you. Thank you so much guys. Let's have a round of applause and all of you guys can stay glued to your seats. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, for moderating the session for all of us. And I hope this panel discussion has motivated all of you guys to buy this book, to read it, to share it, and to internalize it. Each idea which has motivated all of you guys today will show us ways to get back to our proud Indian culture developed within each one of us as a sense of active and constructive nationalism. And now I request... Mr. Sai Deepak, to just read few lines from the book, please, and to also share your thought of opinions on that. Thank you. And this is on request for all of the special Bengaluru people here tonight. Thank you. My audible? Better? No. Okay. So I'll use the mic. I'll use the mic. So there are certain portions of the book that I thought uh, warrant reading so that you get uh, the essence of the book and you also understand how serious this book is in terms of its current relevance. So let me start with uh, certain portions of the first section. The title of the first chapter is The Seeds of Pakistan. and the final chapter deals with certain riots from 1921 to 1924 and the title of the chapter is Malegaon, Malabar, Gulga Gulbarga and Kohat, the two nation theory in action. Let me start perhaps with the two nation theory itself, I'll do that. Uh, how much time do we have, 15 minutes max? 15 minutes, okay, so I'll keep it under that. Certain portions from chapter 1, certain portions from chapter 2, and the final chapter is what I'd want to read. Seeds of Pakistan. In chapter 6 of my first book, India that is Bharat, I introduced the concept of Middle Eastern coloniality and briefly touched upon its concrete manifestation in the history of Bharat, namely the birth of the idea of Pakistan. I took the view that the creation of Pakistan must be seen as part of Middle Eastern coloniality's long, troubled, and continuing encounter with the Indic civilization. The violent creation of Pakistan has been the subject of tomes of literature. So to avoid being redundant, I intend to view it through the prism of Middle Eastern coloniality to examine its impact on the shaping of Bharat, especially its legal and constitutional infrastructure. In popular discourse, the partition of Bengal in 1905 on religious lines by the British is credited with sowing the seeds of the idea of Pakistan. This has created the false impression of communal harmony having existed between Hindus and Muslims prior to the employment of the so-called divide and rule policy by the British in 1905. While British motivations behind the partition of Bengal and their subsequent hand in nurturing the idea of Pakistan must and will be examined in some detail, an exclusive focus on British machinations creates the erroneous notion of Hindus and Muslims being equal victims of British rule, 
drawing attention away from express attempts to restore Islamic rule over Bharat. It bears noting that an Anglo-centric approach which gives Middle Eastern coloniality a free pass in the context of Bharat's partition is largely a product of the post-colonial school. This therefore reinforced for a decolonial approach to Bharat's history to prevent the sugar coating of facts with generous dollops of post-colonial secularization. To understand the larger backdrop against which the pan-Islamic movements of the 1800s, such as the lesser known Farezi movement in Eastern Bengal and the better known Bahabi movement which started in Delhi and spread to different parts of Bharat, we must travel further back in time. A clear understanding of the origins, nature, inspiration and aims of both the movements and their successors is called for in order to grasp the full extent of the psychology and pathology of Middle Eastern coloniality. I have consciously chosen to write about these movements since their profound impact on the revival of Middle Eastern coloniality's quest to regain control over Bharat is rarely mentioned, let alone discussed in contemporary discourse out of a misplaced sense of political correctness, also known as Indian secularism. This is despite the Indian Wahhabi movement's manifest and critical contribution to the laying of a fertile ground for Wahhabism, not just in undivided Bharat, but also in the larger Indian subcontinent, the impact of which is still being felt in one way or another. Perhaps there is discomfiture in certain secular quarters in recognizing the fact that the Wahhabi mindset had and continues to have a strong Indian base. In the absence of this big picture, the Bharatiya mind, which is currently buried under three layers of coloniality, European, Middle Eastern, and Nehruvian Marxist, will continue to consume popular, comforting, and infantile fictions. One such fiction is the existence of a Ganga Jamini Tehseeb, the much-touted composite cultural creature that is the supposed product of a syncretic relationship between Hinduism and Islam, creating the so-called unique Indian Islam. To precisely overcome these perception barriers so that the facts finally have a chance to breathe and shape the truth, I will touch upon the circumstances which led to the rise of pan-Islamic movements in Bharat. So this is more or less the, the tone for the book. This explains my motivations and the, the, the journey of the book. Then some portions on the two-nation theory, which may help. 74. This is on page 74 under the title, The Two-Nation Theory. Because we are being told that Savarkar is the progenitor of the two-nation theory. The two-nation theory had come into existence before Savarkar was even born. Contrary to what some would have us believe, this much is clear from the journey of Syed Ahmad Khan. That the two-nation theory was not the product of a sudden disillusionment with the Hindu majority Indian National Congress, which was founded in 1885. It was present all along as reflected in Khan's own earliest writings in 1847, in which he openly expressed support for the Wahhabis. Even in his book, Causes of the Indian Revolt, which was originally published in Urdu in 1858, he referred to Hindus and Muslims as two antagonistic races when highlighting the British folly of bringing them together in a single unit, thereby endangering the British position. Not only did Khan subscribe to the view that the communities were two different and antagonistic races stroke nations, he also wanted the British to keep them apart in order to preserve the British control over Bharat. Again in 1867, when a debate arose as to whether Hindi or Urdu should be used in vernacular universities being set up and for administrative purposes, which snowballed into the Urdu movement, Khan was reported to have told the commissioner of Banaras that Hindus and Muslims were two nations and even spoke of the separate political evolution of Muslims. In fact, deposing before the Commission on Indian Education, helmed by W. W. Hunter, Khan is reported to have passionately argued that Urdu was the language of gentry and of people of high social standing, whereas Hindi was to be the vulgar, which is to say that it was to be spoken only by the common population. Khan was of the view that the replacement of Urdu by Hindi would reinforce the loss of Muslim authority over Bharat, 
which led him to advocate Urdu as a symbol of Muslim heritage. He was supported in this position by Muslims across the board, including his opponents from within the Muslim community, leading to the founding of organizations such as the Urdu Defense Association. This was yet another clear manifestation of the two-nation theory, which would significantly contribute towards the crystallization of Pakistan once the cause was adopted by the All India Muslim League. And now I'll read just one portion from the final chapter on the riots. This is page 484. The title of the chapter is Malikao, Malabar, Gulbarga and Kohat, the two nation theory in action. So what I've done is every chapter or a subsection has a picture. The picture for this particular chapter is the Mopla war knife so that you know what it stands for. This was a banned weapon under the British. Secular historians have often characterized some of the Hindu-Muslim riots which took place during the Khilafat years as peasant rebellions against Hindu landlords or attacks on Hindu collaborators of the British or have held that the attacks on Hindus were merely incidental to the attacks on the colonial establishment. However, this is patently inaccurate representation of facts given the long history of riots between the two communities for a variety of reasons including, I'm sure you'll be able to relate to this, cow slaughter, and processions before mosques, much before the riots of the Khilafat years. In the previous chapter, I had mentioned the unraveling of an already uneasy and short-lived Hindu-Muslim honeymoon phase by mid-1921 on account of frequent riots between the two communities, the most prominent of them being the Mopla riots in the Malabar, whose beginnings are typically traced to August 1921. However, Malabar was not the only flashpoint. As C. Sankaran Nair points out in his book, Gandhi and Anarchy, thanks to Gandhi's encouragement of the Khilafat agitation and its pan-Islamic vision, there were riots in Malegao, Malabar, Multan, Lahore, Saharanpur, Amritsar, Allahabad, Calcutta, Delhi, Gulbarga, Kohat, Lucknow, Shah Jahanpur, and Nagpur during the core Khilafat period, that is 1919 to 1924. This is attested to by Gopala Krishna, one of the scholars I've referred to in his study of communal violence in Bharat. Audible? Yes. This is attested to by Gopala Krishna too in his study of communal violence in Bharat as well as by Dr. Ambedkar in his book Pakistan with the Partition of India. Of these, I have chosen four riots to discuss in order to demonstrate the position that Hindu-Muslim unity that began with the Lucknow Pact of 1916 until 1921 was the exception and not the norm and importantly simply a product of political necessity on both sides. There was no Ganga Jamani Tehzeeb foundation to begin with for the unity to last. Therefore, it was bound to come undone, especially once the Khilafatists no longer needed Hindu support anymore for their agitation in view of the developments in Turkey which robbed them of their purpose. Now, here you may want to focus on the table on page number 485 because I have given the importance of demographic balance. Critically, it is important to understand the demographic status of Muslims in Bharat as of 1921. 
The following is a table from Mushirul Hassan's book, Nationalism and Communal Politics in India, 1916 to 1928, capturing the proportion of Muslim population in the provinces based on the census of 1921. Madras, 6.71%. Bombay, 19.74%. Bengal, 54 United Provinces, 14.28%. Punjab, 55.33%. Bihar and Orissa, 10.85. Central provinces, 4.05. Assam, 28.96 in 1921. Northwest frontier province, 91.62%. That should tell you that the future provinces of Pakistan were ready by 1921. When the Kohat riots took place in September 1924 in NWFP, Hindus versus Muslims in terms of population was 7 versus 93. Outnumbered fully. In light of these figures in, uh, of these figures in 1921, perhaps the frequent riots in Bengal, Punjab and NWFP were to be expected to the point of... Yeah. To the point of exodus of Hindus in places like Kohat in the NWFP. In hindsight, it is not surprising that the demography of these provinces contributed significantly to the solidification of Pakistan by 1946, both politically and territorially in a matter of just a quarter of a century. I'll just finish the conclusion and then with that we should be done because by the time I finish the conclusion at 2 a.m. on the 20th of June, Despite my fairly, let's say, unemotional nature, I had tears for the simple reason that reading through the letters written by Annie Besant of the description of the Mopla riots and the atrocities committed, it must take a fairly hard-hearted person to not be moved by it. Conclusion. Oh, in fact, I'll just read two more portions. I'm so sorry. Just give me a moment. So remember that um, Ernard and one more district of uh, what we know as Palakkad today were the epicenters of the Mopla riots. It was not a riot, it was an outrage. Now here's the stellar example of the collaboration between the Islamist stroke jihadis and the communists. Based on all the factual material produced here above from multiple sources, I leave it to the reader to decide whether the Mopla outrage was indeed driven by tenancy-related grievances or religious fanaticism or patriotic anti-colonial sentiments or a combination of these. And if it is the latter, which sentiment was most predominant? Here is one final extract on the subject by way of an epilogue to the outrage. In 1969, please pay attention to this. In response to the demands of the Muslim League in Kerala, this is in 1969, and as a reward for its political support, the United Front Ministry of EMS Nambudri Pad redrew the boundaries of Kodikod and Palaka districts so as to carve out the new predominantly Muslim district of Malappuram. Denounced by its opponents as the illegitimate child of the two nation theory, Malappuram, Moplasthan to its critics. Combined within a single district, those taluks, which 48 years before, in 1921, had been the scene of the Mapla rebellion. In 1957, EMS Nambudri Pad had the distinction of heading the first democratically elected communist government in Bharat and the second ever communist government to be democratically elected in the world after the 1945 election of a communist government in the Republic of San Marino in Europe. In his second term as the chief minister of Kerala from 1967 to 69, Nambudri Path created the Muslim majority Malappuram district by combining those taluks which were the centers of Mopla outrage in 1921. Now here's the final stinger. According to the 2011 census, 2011 census, Muslims constituted 70.24% of the total population in the district of Malappuram, whereas the Hindus constituted 27.6% and Christian 1.98%. We are in 2022. With this, 
the discussion sought to be undertaken in this book comes to an end this much is clear by the end of 1924 bharat's indigenous consciousness may have found a way although not ideal to live with a dual consciousness namely the bharatiya and the european however it was once again confronted with an earlier form of coloniality namely middle eastern which had managed to revive reinvent and organize itself after the decline of the mughal empire and was once again on the march this time around bharat was ill prepared to deal with this challenge owing to its dual consciousness which severely limited its ability to call a spade a spade consequently bharat had embarked on the fatal path of accommodation and compromise under the burden of values inherited from the christian european colonizer which muddled its sense of self in the process leaving it woefully ill equipped to weather the storm which was no more brewing but had already announced its bloody arrival or more accurately re arrival by the end of 1924 accordingly in the next book i will resume this civilizational constitutional discussion from 1925 and continue with the examination of undivided bharat's fateful journey towards pakistan or the partition of the sacred geography bharat finally my experience of writing this book has left me all the more convinced that any reading or interpretation of the constitution which is oblivious to the history of this land is bound to further the cause of either or both forms of colonialities namely european and middle eastern much to the detriment of indic civilizational consciousness to paraphrase writer and philosopher george santayana those who do not learn from history are doomed and dare i say cursed and condemned to repeat it jai hind thank you thank you so much deepak for completing the moment for all of us and a big big round of applause to our admission pandas shri pai as well thank you so much for greeting all of us this evening and now yes i request dr swaroop rangna the co-founder of satwa to deliver the vote of thanks for all of us please i thank uh, sai deepak ji for giving us an opportunity to work with him in this event i also thank uh, padma shri mohandas pai ji for accepting our invitation and enlightening us with significant insights i thank this beautiful crowd for having given us such a beautiful positive vibe by their mere presence and they all they are so accommodative that they came and created a patishala environment as deepak ji told um, i thank neel for moderating um, and uh, the discussion went on in a spectacular manner i'm very sure i thank all the volunteers for running this show smoothly uh, you know handling uh, sometimes uh, deepak ji's crowd is very difficult yeah and yet all our volunteers did it so one of my friends were telling uh, probably handling rajnikanth's crowd is much easier it's not easy to handle sai deepak ji's crowd <laughs> and i thank murli ji for uh, live streaming this event and um, i thank kripa and shilpa for dispensing aroma across the venue uh, you have a beautiful aroma i don't know how many of you felt it in the heat of this discussion and um, i have to specially mention this i think uh, i thank uh, shri lakshmi narayanan a uh, founder of shri parash gurukula uh, he is a very very special person i'll tell you why for two reasons one he has created professionals uh, chartered accountants advocates scientists physicists who will wear shikha and go to college universities to christ university to be more precise and you know what all of them are well read in the itihasa purana dharma shastras and have learned vedic chanting and they practice all of these things which they uh, have learned it right from the childhood days so this is the kind of blend you know he has created in the society in a small place in uh, shiranga patanam you all have to visit that place it's on the bank of gangas uh, sorry uh, kaveri and um, i thank once again uh lakshmi narayan ji for being here and uh, bringing all of his students here who are working as volunteers all those volunteers are serving you food remember there are scientists there chartered accountants there advocates there yeah and i thank uh, jagdish kadurka for this beautiful art which you see in the front i request all of you to create a new trend with this you know what 
I, I've seen a lot of people going to the gym using the crossbar for so many reasons. Why don't you tell your friends to use the crossbar, hang around and put child and start swinging like Bhima and call it as Bhima Sana. Try and make this a trend, please. Please. Yeah. And um, finally, uh, before we wind up, I thank Prasad and team for the wonderful snacks. And you have dinner now. Please don't miss that. Um, and before you leave this place, in case you have feedback, uh, there are a lot of uh, the QR codes there which you will see. You can click on them. You can scan them and give a feedback to us. Whether you buy my book or not, please buy the Devabhasha kits for sure. Yes. So, that was the next thing I was about to tell. Uh, we have come up with the world's first Sanskrita card game. Uh, and with this Sanskrita card game, without a textbook, you can learn Sanskritam. Yeah? The Neil who was moderating here uh, is one of the uh, uh, team members of Sattva and he has also ha owns uh, Kulcha. Uh, we all collaborated and did this. Uh, so, buy this please and also buy the book without fail. We have Sai Deepak Ji here who will sign and we have sel uh, you know, selfie moments here. Uh, before you wind up and you know, before you go for the dinner, I have a small request, listen to me carefully. Definitely all the 600 people come onto the stage for a selfie, we can't handle that. Okay, I know your excitement, we respect that. Sir will spend one hour with us for the selfie. Mod I, I hope Mohandas Pai Ji <laughs> will be able to spend some time with us as well. Uh, so uh, both of them will be there, I assure you on their behalf. <laughs> so all that you need to do is our team will be managing managing in the sense they'll facilitate you uh, please use this opportunity don't spend more than 30 seconds that's too much <laughs> so quick, quick selfie and uh, signature uh, autograph on the on the book which you have bought please buy the book and come back in adequate time all those who already bought the book I know you're ready for the queue yeah uh, thank you so much for all of the people who have come here and made uh, a great uh, thank you once again Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for all that love and support. And this is your host, Navita Sahib. We request all of you guys to kindly have dinner and then leave. Please do not forget to buy the copy of this beautiful book. And let's have all of them quickly walk up for dinner and buy the book. And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. And this is your host, Navita, signing off. Thank you.